right. And okay. now we are off to the races. Again, this is Dr. Babette Babich, 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 Babich sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> of Fordham University, uh, and she's cosmopolitan. So really, I can't really reasonably say she teaches merely from there. Uh, but I discovered you chiefly through some of the lectures that you have up on YouTube uh, that you had done in connection with the events of recent years. Um, and then somewhat providentially uh, encountered the works of Gunther Anders to another friend, but then you have a lot of material on Gunther Anders. And I was actually just sort of blown away by Anders work. Who is this guy? You really don't hear much about him, but his analyses seems so prescient and so germane to the present moment, it's almost astonishing that it's not in greater circulation. Um, the work in particular through which I arrived at uh, Anders was uh, part of a broader work, but um, his thesis, World as Phantom and as Matrix, part of a criticism of broadcast media. As he's writing it, he's talking principally of radio and television. Uh, but what he says to me ramifies even more intensely in, in the digital age than it did when he was writing, though some modifications might be appended. But now, let me, you know, having said that as a way of just opening the conversation, just turn it over to you and, and, and maybe you could just start by saying, what is your relationship with Gunther Anders? What part of his work do you want to really foreground as relevant to the present wow that's a that's a difficult that's a difficult thing because i've just written a book and it's always hard to know except that my teacher was don Idy, who's very important in the philosophy of technology yes and yes, he, hated, he, Go on. he hated hated gunther anders he made sure that no one would ever translate anders work and he was very proud of this and it's not an accident because one of the things that you'll see for anyone who does philosophy of technology, I mean, I've noticed some of your, some of your uh, YouTube videos, you will talk about the machine, which is a wonderful kind of beginning point that you have. And you say it, you've said it more than once uh, with, with reference to the machine. And when I teach philosophy of technology, I always remind my students that you can't hack anything. You can only do it the way it lets you do it. There's no, there's, there's no workaround. The workaround is just bringing yourself around to the way it wants you to do it. And there really is no other way. What ID stressed and what all philosophers after ID stress is that you have to work with technology, with corporations, with big pharma, with big tech, with anything in order to have a philosophical point of view on it. Meaning that everyone has to be positive. Now, the problem with, 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 with Gunther Anders here is that he's, he's, he's almost constitutionally depressive. His, his parents were psychologists. His father invented the IQ test and the tone generator that you use when you're having your hearing, che hearing checked, you know? Mm -hmm. And therefore, very important people in what became 20th century psychology. But they also allowed him to have the liberty to be depressed, which is an interesting thing, because I think if you're not the child of psychologists, maybe you worry, perhaps I'm too hyper, or perhaps this other thing is happening, and you psychoanalyze yourself. He never psychoanalyzed himself. It's a very interesting thing, because it had been done to him since he was a child, and he was bored by it. So he didn't indulge in that. But he was negative, depressive and negative and constantly, unremittingly on the same point. So when you read Anders, he doesn't just say the thing once, it's bad on the way we are dependent on machines, or there are problems with the bomb, or there are problems with our desire to be as efficient as our machines, uh, or, or, or to be really, really hooked into our machines. I mean, this is our new vanity, where, where we want to be extremely good with our cell phones. As, as if that were an achievement, right? Because of course, what you're doing when you're very good at your cell phones is you are destroying the 
fat in your fingers because it's the fat in your fingers that allows that allows that little connection to take place because you are electric and that's how it works. So one of the reasons children are better is because they they have fatter fingers and elderly people are not good because their fingers are scrawny. And it's as simple as that. It's not that they're incompetent. They are doing the right things, but it doesn't work for them because the switch, as it were, isn't closing. It isn't connecting. So, so the reason what got me into Anders was my interest in philosophy of technology and science. The fact that I was in science, the fact that I was at Stony Brook, and lo and behold, there was Don Eide, who had reviewed a book, a proposal, to translate Anders. I think that must have been in the 60s, and said no. And he said with pride, it will never be in English. And he's right, because it's 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 Effectively. years later and it's not in English. Right, right. You, you, I was fortunate to come across a partial translation on Libcom. Um, but I, I don't have enough German to be able to access it in the original German. I believe he wrote it in German, right? Because yes. there in Spanish there are French translations. That's right, that's right. Uh, um, you know, I mean, I've heard uh, Don Eide's name. These, are, these uh, are the two things. These are the two books. This is this is the first volume, Esteban, first volume. And then he gets really, really big because of all of the uh, atom testing, the, the bomb testing that goes on, and the fact that he basically really just collects all of his essays and puts them together in volume two. Uh, and he organizes them around the theme of, and that one is available in a version of English which was translated from the Spanish, so it's kind of awful, but kind of great, because you can you can read it. Yeah, it's a way in. It's a way in. So, um, so I guess... Yeah, no, actually, I'm kind of surprised. Like, I've heard Don Eide's name. I can't say I'm very familiar with his specific takes uh, or uh, technological positions, as it were. Uh, I'm very hostile, uh, as you know, you've already gathered, to the contemporary technological milieu. That probably has a lot to do with the fact that in my training, I right off the bat became aware of the limitations of the Cartesian framing and the Cartesian characterization of the scientific project is one where we strive for domination of nature, but to subjugate nature, bring it under our control so that then, you know, it's essentially a utopian and more or less naively hedonistic framework, which is implied by Descartes. And I don't think Descartes himself was fully alive to the implications of what he said or what he was doing. But in any event, uh, having made that perhaps audaciously derisive claim uh, regarding Rene Descartes, um, I've retained that sense of skepticism about the scientific project. Uh, and thus my affinity for other figures like Jacques Ellul or Ivan Illich or Gunther Anders, and, and there's definitely a resonance across those three, you know, something very Alulian at times I think about Anders, or maybe Alu is, Alu is perhaps Andersian, you know, it's hard to necessarily track whether there are, you know, genetic relationships between these ideas or whether they're just working out of a kind of a zeitgeist. Um, but why now I ask you about your book, and what you are uh, advancing in your book about Anders. Well, and then, oh, sorry, sorry, two questions, right? Sure. All right. I'm actually surprised to hear that anyone would just be so reflexively hostile that they would want to suppress the translation or publication of the work of someone like Anders. Yes, he's, he's not necessarily going to like, you know, he's depressive, but it's, he's also incredibly incisive in a way that I, I don't understand why someone would be so straightforwardly antagonistic. Uh, it seems like a, so what, what is the basis of ID's antagonism? You know, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that and or what is your book about? I'm supposed, so those are to be two questions, so. And then you can go from there. So well, I, I mention it in the book because it's honest. I mean, I have to point it out. And 
people often wonder why Anders has never been translated. And it's not an accident because there's peer review and Eide was certainly up here. So that would have happened. Eide was about 10 years, he's still alive, 10 years younger uh, than, than Anders. And so that that's a peer. Mm-hmm. Everyone thinks that's a big difference, but that counts as a peer. And, and he basically said no. But I, I said it very quickly previ- previously, and perhaps it went by too fast. But it's extremely important in philosophy of technology. You're not allowed to criticize. You're not allowed to raise questions against technology because basically the thesis is that technology is fundamentally neutral and it's the use we make of it. And okay. It's something that also got in the way with Elul. You mentioned Jacques Elul, brilliant man. One of the things he understands and emphasizes in his work on technology is that in the end, once you start it, there's no stopping. It's, there is no way to work with it. There is no way to have a positive or, 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 or effective thing. But the same thing that Heidegger says, although he's a little more forbidding in his discussion of technology, especially in his discussion of Gelassenheit. He says, even if we don't destroy ourselves with the bomb, and he's it's it, it, and he's right on point with regard to the current uh, reflections on, on 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 vaccination. Unfortunately, he says we are playing with things that will change the stuff of life if we are successful. And he was right because the man he talks about in Galassenheit is the one who was experimenting on the tomato on on the tobacco mosaic virus, Wendell Stanley, and who won a Nobel Prize for that. So Heidegger was talking at that moment exactly about that which was at a meeting of the Nobel Prize winners, one of the things Stanley was saying, we're going to control life, we're going to crystallize life, it's going to happen. And that language of crystallizing life, remember they hadn't yet finished, You know, the, the, I started in biology, so this is all very present to me, but they hadn't really at that point worked out all the things with what would be Linus Pauling and a bunch of other, Rosalind Franklin, et cetera, a crystallographer on DNA. But what we're doing now is not that kind of biology and not that kind of crystal, but it's something slightly different related to nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is an answer to something we've been looking at for a long time, and that is a machine that goes of itself. Very, very tiny things that self-assemble. You don't need, you don't need a little motor in order to get them to work. They 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 put themselves together and then hook on to other things without uh, any 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 driving force. So what ID didn't want was what Heidegger was selling. He didn't want this idea that there would be something even more dangerous if everything turned out to be positive, that the positive success of not blowing ourselves up, as Heidegger pointed it out, he was already aware of what his student Gunther Anders would do and would be talking about for the rest of his life. For Heidegger, what would be changed would be humanity. And that's 1955. It's a very, very interesting thing that he would already be saying that there's a lot of popularity at making fun of Heidegger or he didn't really know, but he knew a great deal and he knew enough to inspire Anders, who was very taken with Heidegger. So I'm a bit of a Heideggerian. I'm interested in Heidegger on these other questions, but I'm mostly interested in science. The reason that 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 I realized I had to write a book on 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 Anders' philosophy of technology is really that we're talking to each other over Zoom, which is fascinating. But Anders first writes, as many of these thinkers first write, in the wake of the most important revolution of the time, and that was broadcast radio. And therefore, everything changed. He was a musician. And so it was intriguing to him as and a guy no one can read, Theodore Adorno. He just insults everyone. It's very awful. But, 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 but he was a composer as well. He's also preoccupied with what happens to music when you record it. Oh, oh really yeah. Music. Walter Benjamin as well, right? You know. Yes. So all right. I mean, though, he doesn't, I think, talk so much about music, but, you know, the reproduction. Yes. Well, right. he talked very little about it, but but there was the same point, and Adorno went on and on and on about the reproduction. Because, of course, as any musician will tell you, you really want to have the live music. And now we don't mind musicians these days, don't mind so much, because they think, well, maybe we could sell NFT or tokens of our stuff, and then people, you know, and our stock would go up and everything would be great. But no one would ever hear us actually play in person. But there's a tremendous difference between the sound. These are headphones and strings that are attached to headphones. And I have other headphones. I have, I have, because I have a razor, I have a Kraken headphone, 
which is a terrible thing. Now, I have all the equipment you could possibly want. But what happens when you have that kind of technology, and there's a beautiful essay uh, on this, which I cite in The Hallelujah Effect, which is a different book, uh, but which points out that we, if you give us the right kind of technology, the right kind of screen, the right kind of headphones, something in our ears, something maybe conducting into our skull, so that like the skull candy, which is very popular, then we won't care that the fidelity is 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 is, is terrible, that the fidelity rots, that you actually have no true to the sound reproduction whatsoever, and we can engineer the sound so that you feel as if you're listening to Michael Jackson or you're, that you're, or, as, or as if you're listening to Lady Gaga or if you're listening to anybody that you like, but it will be at lower level, but you won't mind because it will be, you'll be that close. It will be, it's a matter of having the, if you like, the, the peanut gallery seats in terms of the quality of sound, but you're up close and center. So you have, and that's the same thing also for your visual perception, for the pixels that we no longer pay any attention to. So we don't have the quality of film any longer. We don't have the quality of, 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 of what used to be possible for film, but, it, but we have things that we take for granted, kind of like the fuzziness of them. I love your background. You know, <laughs> if I've, I've chosen blur. I used to have all kinds of, you know, graphics behind me and I went for that because we actually like the defect. There's, there's a sense in which that appeals to us. So, well, I mean, there you're talking about how, in a sense, you don't want the film or whatever the artifact in question is, you don't want simple mimesis, right? You want the whatever is presencing itself to you to be presencing yourself to you as what it is, not as what it is qua representation. Right. And with the film, like actual film, there is a kind of, I don't know whether there's a kind of shimmering quality to it, which on one level might say gives the lie, but in fact, it's paradoxically more honest because it's telling you what, what is it that you're engaging when you have an absolute perfect simulation, there's something eerie about that. It's almost like announcing a failure. Um, with a, with a kind of savage pride. Um, but um, anyway, I don't mean to interrupt you, so. It, it anesthetizes us. We love it. We love the sound. Uh, one of the thing, first things that happened with the Walkman, and Neil Postman analyzes this, is he's, 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 he's correct about that in his Technopoly. Uh, and many, and, and, and Marcuse analyzes it. What, but he's not talking about that. That's ten years before, so he's not talking about uh, Walkmans. But he's talking about a transistor radio, because the very ability that you have to have music wherever you go means that you can have a soundtrack of your life, and that's something that starts in 1923 in Berlin when the first, there's only one radio broadcast comes in, and that's when Anders really starts. He really realizes something's going on. So does Rudolf Arnheim, who writes a book called Radio. He's a big person in psychology. Uh, and so does Adorno, and so does Brecht. So radio, everybody's writing about this radio phenomenon because it's never been experienced before. Even Heidegger writes about it which is a very interesting thing. Even Heidegger says, you know, everyone's got to have, even the maid has to have her own radio set. So kind of a crystal radio at the time, but everyone has to have their own because even though it's the same thing and everyone can hear the same thing because there's only one sender, there's only one station, they all want this closeness. So you you develop an absolute relationship with the thing, the the, the technology, the uh, whatever it is that you're using and people will curate YouTube lists and so on and so forth. But the problem is that that is what is used to dominate consciousness. And that's really something that you have to unpack and tease out of reading Elul, reading uh, Adorno, but Adorno sort of complains about the music while he's doing it so one can lose the thread. But Anders doesn't. Anders emphasizes that what you're really doing is you're bringing something into the individual, into their home, and because you're doing that, they themselves are lockstep in the world. 
It's the same point Nietzsche had made a long, long time ago in a book that most people kind of read and don't read, which is Human All to Human, in which he points out that the real problem with great politics, with wars, is that they don't really concern you. But if you start caring about them, you lose your life. Now, it, it matters if the war is happening in your backyard, but great politics means that you want to be involved with controlling, well, it's like caring about the Ukraine. Right. Which I do care so, about, but, you know, it's that kind of thing. But, but, but in fact, the, it's, yeah. it's not yeah. here. Right. So, like, you, you, you see, the problem is that for most people, they care about the Ukraine in a manner which is not actually qualitatively so different from how they care about the outcome of uh, a football game. It may sound crude and insulting to them for me to make that assertion, but if they were, you know, are they, are, are they you know, trying to get to the Ukraine? Are they trying to, you know, sign up to be a, a part of the conflict, you know, or act in a humanitarian fashion? Now, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm being a bit harsh. Okay. No, no, that's that's the, that's but, what Anders argues. Anders but, argues that that sports is used in the same way, that that one uses, say, the World Cup in a way to get people out of their out of their own concerns, out of their own lives, out of their own issues, the things that matter to them and that are important. And Illich would would emphasize things in a fairly similar way, and instead think about something that in fact has nothing to do with them, nothing. But they feel that it has something to do with them. And sure. this is part of what I really took out of um, his, you know, the world is phantom and his matrix in his analysis of how the relationship with our world is transfigured. Yes. Because now it's something that we, in, you know, we just sit in our living room and the world comes to us. And at the same time, you have evoked by this occurrence a sense of overwhelming potency, but also overwhelming impotence because you can't actually affect the outcome of whatever it is that is coming into your living room, but you can look at it with no real apparent sense of hazard. You know, you, you do feel a sense of godlike perspective, even etymologically, what are the gods? They're those who look down on us. And now you like a god are looking down and over this, right? And so there's this bizarre ambiguity as to what happens when the world is available to everybody. Right. That's, um, that's the problem. And that's what happened for two years with COVID. Because everything that Anders is talking about, we all just experienced. And in a way, COVID could never have happened if we weren't already so cued in. Yes, I mean, but... I mean, it, it was it was astonishing to speak frankly of how willing people were to depart from the implications of their own intelligence, of their own common sense. In my in my in my reading, right? I mean, uh, <coughs> yes, there were aspects the of the received narrative <clears throat> that, to me, just fantastical in their audacity just so obviously, obviously flawed that, that I was, you know, taken aback. I was, I was, I was, I was really just displaced from any sense of how I could even act because of this bizarre um, circumstance where, where people were just compliant with, um, with frankly, with a level of, 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 of deception that I think is without historical precedent. Now, of course, you, you <clears throat> were drawn into this thwarted conversation. He's like, well, you know, maybe they just didn't know. There's misunderstanding. There's deception. There's, there's all that stuff, right? It's not like one thing. There's all of it. But um, as noted, what you have is that people become involved in a drama which is a collective social drama, which is generated through the activation of a media, I don't know what you want to call it, apparatus um, that orchestrates this, yes. orchestrates this. And the fact that it was done so ubiquitously 
and with such a high level of compliance speaks to the extent to which people have been taken out of their own mind, their own, their own intelligence. Um, perhaps that sounds very harsh, right? You know, but I mean, that's certainly how I have experienced the last few years. So oh, it's empirical, but, but remember it, when, when they, the, there's a metaphor of, of, of the perfect storm, but that was what was set up. And the kind of thing that Anders analyzed with regard to that phantom and matrix, or the kind of thing that Elul talks about, or the kind of thing even that in, in a certain respect, but not as much Elul will, um, I mean, Illich will discuss, that's all being connected with YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, social media, where you're getting your news in that way. And I think, frankly, pornography has a lot to do with that. So that there are elements of an absolutely intimate relationship with the machine that didn't exist previously. I mean, if you were to go, and that's something that Anders really picks up on previously, Smith and Miller, would go to them would go to the theater he would say and they would meet they would see their their neighbors and they would talk how you know how's by you that kind of thing and then now what you have is an opportunity not to have to leave home at all but that means you also don't have to leave your bedroom you also don't you can be by yourself it can be something that is you and and that was something that when when i was at boston college many many years ago uh, when 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 Gadamer was 80 long time ago but I first noticed the relationship of the geeks. Those people, those were the kids at MIT. I was at BC, MIT. And they would be the ones who were really focused on their keyboards. And I realized at that moment that what they liked about that was that the tiny action response that they got, which is simple cybernetics, was deeply satisfying to them. They got a response. It's like the little ping pong game that used to be played. One thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. And it's and you get a little tiny jolt of happiness for each thing that actually works. The reason people can spend three hours setting up a program, three hours, and or, or designing a web page, and then look up and say, oh my God, it's three in the morning. How could that happen? It happens because that tiny, tiny little, tiny part, tiny part, tiny part, really tranquilizes you it locks you into it and then you're in this tunnel and you don't leave so when you say to people you've got to keep six feet distance it's a very very important indication you're preventing <laughs> conversation of a casual kind and conversation of a casual kind and this is this is Illich's point about the good samaritan where the issue is not who's who's your neighbor but the idea that you should choose your neighbor choose to listen to this person rather than not which is a wonderful insight that Illich has uh, because we don't usually do that we just generalize we should be nice to everybody rather than the schmuck we, we, we just stepped over you know not that one and he's like choose that one make that one the choice but in this particular case a person you didn't expect to say anything to you could say is this is a this is a this, you know, this is a load of whatever. And then you just hear that and instantly you would realize, you know, then this is silly. This is how the emperor has no clothes inside of the little kid who says that how it works. He's got to be close enough. He's tiny to people that they can hear him when he says he's naked. Otherwise you can't hear him. Six feet is all you need to make sure that the average person cannot hear you cannot hear you, especially as our ears and our hearing, no matter what age we are, is systematically destroyed by the fact that we put headphones in our ears, which destroys our hearing, of course, because there are these little hairs which kind of lie down and die after a while. Is there you now. also, now your remark make, puts me in mind of like the notion of friendship as conspiracy. Yes. That with distance, even that physical distance, you're yes. undermining the capacity of that conspiracy yeah. of friendship, which is so antithetical to the integrity of the system, right? Because every friendship, and I guess T.S. Lewis made this, makes this remark, creates a bond between those people that serves as a buffer against despotism and, yeah. and oppression. So... When that then becomes physically, the, the, when you physically instantiate a distance between people, even ritualistically, you're undercutting that point of subversion and subversiveness. Yes. And they choose to be alone anyway when because they would prefer, as Anders says, they don't want to miss a moment. So they would prefer 
to have a good view of the game by being at home rather than going to the game because you get you can see what the, what the, what the people who are calling the the plays and you can understand it better experience it better so so it's that's what i mean by that perfect storm it's a combination of things it's not simply just one thing if it were just one thing it wouldn't have worked but we were already set up mm -hmm. we were already primed to use the language of the business school to expect and to look for our news in very specific ways, less and less from the television and from the nightly news, more and more from online news sources. Now, so perhaps you could, well, we've already sort of touched a lot of ground here. Sorry, um, yes. No, well, no, I just- well, It's all mounted together and you raised such an interesting question. So, um, So it strikes me toward the end, as I recall, of um, you talk about how he's sort of, you know, a, a rather depressive person to read. Um, <laughs> but toward the end of, uh, you know, the world is uh, Matrix and his uh, Phantom, world is Phantom and his Matrix. Um, you have this, this, this question, this, this rather ominous question he poses as to whether or not salvation is possible from this circumstance is it already too late have people actually been desold as it were by the extent of their capture by by the system right you know so because it does and then, i mean he opens that work with this critique and then you know like when i read this it's like oh yeah it's, of course of course it's sort of like i got it all right, because this is a point which is raised by Heidegger and by Elul, but he opens it up. It's like, well, first of all, let's just get this out of the way. You can't talk about technology as merely instrumental. That's malarkey, all right? Um, and he makes the interesting point that anyone who one organizes their life according to the idea that they can implement certain means to create certain ends is already actually suggesting an utterly barbaric relationship with their own life. They're reducing their own life to a technological process. Now, who actually does that, right? You know, and um, when he's writing, I would say not that many people, but today, I think a distressing number of people have been hypnotized into this mode of treating their own life as a technological problem. How do you engineer the components of your existence to produce a particular output and in the process what is escaping apparently most people is that in taking this approach it ramifies for your own soul your own subjectivity you're actually endangering it it's spiritually hazardous now as he reads this maybe because i'm a sympathetic reader it seems almost truistic it seems kind of uh, obvious to me, not because I think I have such profound insight, but it just seems like, well, yes, I mean, there it is. That's that's how it works. I mean, but uh, is this perception of me that this uh, notion that technologically is uh, that technology is not merely instrumental? Is that should that not be a commonplace? And if it is not a commonplace, why why is it not a commonplace? Why is there this retained superstition of Technology is merely instrumental. That's the first question again, interestingly, because that's the point ID really wants to emphasize. As right. he understands that he knows he's too smart to know that technology uh, can't be defined as neutral or this idea of simply an instrument, a tool that we can use one way badly, or of course, that we could use positively. But and therefore give it the spin, which is the positive spin. So the positive spin, which is what one is looking for. It, it requires that we think of technology as a tool and we forget that we are used by the technology that we use. It makes us, we adapt to it. As I've suggested, we, we kind of have no choice. We don't have an option. So is that really true that we don't have an option? Well, I mean, the, the, the there are options that we have, but, but, but it's just, but it's you know it's a seductive thing. We like to think that language of hacking, you know, that we could that we can we can 
and even Heidegger uses that language, you know, Gelassenheit, that we can take it or leave it, that we can use it, but not allow it to use us. But that's not going to happen. If you're using it, it's using you. And and there's no way around that. It's it's sort of the, you know, people are, I mean, Sherry Turkle, who, who was certainly one of the first psychologists to think about this a long time ago, she would say, oh, you know, I, uh, my daughter sleeps with her, her cell phone, so do I. Well, both of you are harming, I would say to them, are destroying yourselves. And yet people do. They do because it's a really great alarm. And you can be sure that it will work in a particular way. Or the, there's music or there's the phenomenon of ASMR, which I'm very interested in, you know, for what that is in terms of psychology and philosophy and so on and how that functions in music. But all of those things don't come without consequences. It's not just that there are negative side effects. You become entrained. You, the reason it works to knock you out, these little apps that you download, is precisely because your brain synchronizes itself and then it's changed. So what you really, I mean, it's sort of obvious, right? But the implication of that circumstance is uh, vigilance emerges as the only antidote because right. it's so ubiquitous that right. you need an almost, you really need to cultivate a kind of heroic uh, will and even sort of an asceticism towards it, not the, to not to, I mean, you can't avoid it, but to minimize its, its uh, implication uh, for your life. That's right. So, that's, that's that's your Ivan Illich, and and my name is pronounced very similar to his because we have right. similar ancestry. So okay. so there, there there is there is that need, as he says, to recognize that there are consequences to the tools that we use and to the way that we can live and be with one another. There, 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 there is, we want to have our cake and eat it too, but that's not really going to happen. You cannot possibly do that. And that, 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 that what I would, what I left out saying, and I was rem reminded of this when you were speaking before, and I left out when you, when you said, well, what, what about the end of the world is phantom and matrix? Because Anders tends to repeat himself and he comes very, very often again and again to the same very sad conclusion. And he's not a theist, which is a very interesting thing. His wife, Hannah Arendt, kind of really was. Heidegger certainly kind of really was. Um, Elul, for sure. Uh, Elul was, 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 a, was a Catholic, uh, a believing uh, lawyer of, of, of canon law, of all things. I mean, Elul is extraordinary. Uh, most of these thinkers who think about technology, Illich obviously was a priest, um, uh, for his life, he was never defrocked. Um, the uh, Anders is the one who's not a believer, and yet he has the best negative theology, because Anders isn't supposing that there's a no god or not a god or an absence of a god which proves God because he's not there. Because then it's, he has a lovely analysis of this, which he writes about in 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 a text which is published on 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 waiting for Godot of all things, which is the middle of the first volume of the antiquatedness of the human, which is, of course, this, this idea of how, and you know, the time question, how you are delayed and what is happening in that respect. But he concludes that that essay in the same way as he does the Phantom and Matrix, which is you're not permitted, even though there's no hope, you are not permitted to give up the effort. And I think that's actually the best we can do, and it's not bad. It's kind of close to to Freud's sort of sort of sort of sort of a, a modified misery of, of of the everyday, if you like, and, or it's similar to uh, insights that you can kind of get from 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 conversations with Kafka and Max Brod. There, there are possible, but but it's a tone. It's a tone of recognizing that even though, and in a way, it's very Kantian. Even though there's not necessarily an outcome that you can count on, a redemption, a salvation, this will fix it, and now we're good. You still are obligated. The imperative is still there. You still have to try. You have to make the effort. It's it's not permitted not to. And in that, I think he he's just as strong as the theists, just as 
as indomitable as those who have faith, even without his faith. And he has seems not to have any. It uh, puts me in mind as well, a bit of Camus in the myth of Sisyphus. Um, that particular text, I think, raises a similar suggestion. But um, not to go too far afield, because it is interesting how the predominance of uh, criticisms of technology derive from those who are theistic in their commitments. Uh, now, on that point of theism, right, um, and how it's not really apparent with Anders, we can raise another related question, that is the question of uh, good and evil. Or if you prefer, I actually prefer the question of the angelic and the demonic in, in, in this world, where you have this situation, which frankly is somewhat barren. And you can almost think of uh, Thomas Hardy's uh, poem, Hap, here, um, where you could say, well, it's just a bad scene. But then is it really just a bad scene? Is it just the outcome of so many stochastic processes? Or this is just like a, a bad iteration of Democritus' vision? Or is there, in fact, something like active malignancy set up against active benevolence? Uh, you know, um, is value part of the world in a deep, sort of ontologically undeniable fashion without appeal to a deity and is this is and if so is that what compels us to persist in a struggle even if we are condemned <laughs> to, to fall <laughs> when Ragnarok comes upon us or what have you if, if if that works for the individual I think that's certainly to be recommended I I think I think that Anders is slightly I mean, he's everyone always talks about Anders in terms of his relationships, you know, his ex-wife or his cousin, Walter Benjamin, we mentioned already, Benjamin. And I think there's a Benjaminian sort of complicated relationship because there is an, an, a kind of very advanced theology which is not making claims about deity. Anytime you are saying things about God, you're of course blaspheming. You are of course, and the, so there's a very Judaic approach and Anders is Jewish and that's part of the, 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 the approach that he's bringing, but he's not, but, 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 but at the very, very least, what he's not reducing things to is the Anders like Arendt, belongs to a, 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 a and and like Jacob Taubes belongs to a to a to a German tradition of of Jews who are terribly Christianized because of course they are educated in the European university which is which is of course Catholic or Protestant especially German it's Protestant it's Lutheran powerfully Lutheran Catholic in the case of Elul in in France but Lul doesn't have a problem, but in the case of 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 the 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 relationship between saying what you know about God, th that's what theologians, that's their stock and trade. They're going to tell you how God works. So, one thing would you assert to be, despite the fact that he's not theistic, is the 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 position of Anders. Is he is he latently theistic? I think he's latently theistic. I think you I think you've already sensed something quite right there because I think operative in him is, however, a non-knowing. He he's not he's not he's not making that claim or making that statement. And I think that one is in this position in this world, at least that's the statement that as he gets older, the way he writes, it seems to be the case that he leaves open a possibility, but he's not speculating. He's simply saying he's he's moved into the space of, of of really not knowing and really saying there is no knowledge of that, which is, of course, what Socrates says in the Apology. So it's the most philosophical perspective that we've got on on an afterlife or on deity or on possibilities after this life, since we are smack in the middle of this life as we speak. Now, let me ask you. Um. Because when I, I, because mostly I just read this one text by him, 
Yeah. And so most of it has to do with media and so forth, right? Mm. Uh, but his was he was really focused very much on opposition to nuclear weaponry mm -hmm. and I presume nuclear power as well. Yes. But could you talk a little bit about his thought in that connection, which of course is not unrelated to his uh, analyses of media and so forth, but nevertheless, as I it would gather a certain distinctness. Right. Well, it is different, but but he finds it related to uh, developing technology because in the case of a, of, a, of a bomb after 1945, uh, in the 10 years following that, uh, in the in, until he 11 years until 1956 when he published his book, what becomes very important for him, and he writes a little poem about a Japanese fisherman who is who's who's, who's who dies as a result of fallout. From one of the 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 tests, he says they're not tests because you didn't test it. You actually did it. You don't test. It's 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 deployed. You have used these bombs again and again and again. But they are developed, as he says, to to not be so dangerous. So the new bombs, and this is exactly where we are today. When Hillary Clinton says, you know, you've got to leave the nuclear option on the table, as if it were like leaving your handbag on the table. Um, the what she's talking about is a tiny bomb, a small bomb, a little bomb, a bomb that is not much of a bomb. But that is exactly what Anders is already writing about. The development that the United States pursues is to make better and better bombs that destroy less and less so that you can use them. And that is, for Anders, the paradox of technology. The technology moves in this direction. It, it plans obsolescence, all of those other things about which he also writes and so on, that this is a desire to have something that is just good enough. I mean, we all know this because we have iPhones, you know, and which iPhone and you think, could I get this one? Because maybe wait until April, you know, that kind of thing. And maybe they'll release, you know, some other benefit that I would, that I would really rather have rather than spend all this money on this one. That is, is, is what Anders was most worried about. Because as he said, really what you're doing is you're, is you're right back to his negative theology. You are making as your tool of detente, of political negotiation, the use of a, of, of a weapon that you, by definition, cannot use. And that's the real monster behind this question of the Ukraine war. Because Russia, people seem to have somehow forgotten this, has an awful array of just these same weapons, as many as we have, if not more, different kinds in different ways. If they begin to lose in the Ukraine, then Anders analyses suddenly become very, very relevant because you can't use them and you can't lose. So if you're in a situation where you press the only other superpower on the earth into a position where it thinks that it's going to lose and it has nothing to lose, then unless something very, very interesting happens, which I cannot imagine, there can be a very, very dangerous consequence. And that dangerous consequence is one which Anders' analysis is that we're committed not to being able to use. Once again, you can only do nothing like waiting for Godot. You can only wait for some, some, something that never happens, something that never comes. We have been having all of my life a and and longer than that for my parents because I wasn't I was I was born as I say in in, in when when Anders' book was published so since then there's these advanced weapons but we had already used two of them in Japan ten years before so the these these weapons have been there and never since used against nations or cities in that way use them again and maybe we have used tiny ones maybe in Lebanon. Right. Maybe tiny ones in the World Trade Center, maybe tiny ones. It's it's a whole question. Certainly they're, they're, they're used in tests. And as Anders argues, we're developing ways to use them in smaller and, you know, mini, right. mini, mi, mini, mini bombs. But but the, his analysis that is to me most persuasive philosophically is that you really have a doomsday machine which works as a doomsday machine if and only if no one uses it. It is a sort of bizarre Democlean sword um, yeah. that, that frankly ties everyone's hands, right? Um, is, I have to actually read, read his analysis. Um, I mean, I don't, I mean. Yes, I have a Facebook, of, a, a Facebook page for people who are interested where I put all of the recent writings of Anders that are in English. 
yes. available so that people can look at them if they want, as well as some nice, helpful summaries by, by colleagues and scholars. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be taking up. Um, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not advertising it. It's nothing for sale. Right. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. But I, I mean, we're running up on an hour here. You've been very generous with your time. So, but please send me eight links like that, and then I'll put them in the description. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, I, I just find, like, even the use of a single nuclear weapon is beyond any kind of logic of justification. Because it's its very nature is indiscriminate in, in what it does. And so there's there's this this almost like it's almost comical the idea that you can harness such sort of structurally indiscriminate, such a structurally indiscriminate implement and 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 pretend that you can you can then control it. And when in fact by definition it's it's beyond control. There, there's like a deep insanity. So uh, I think what stays the hand of those who are in a position is, is uh, a, a, a level of humanity. This, this is my, like, I don't actually believe that Vladimir Putin would use a nuclear weapon. Maybe be, not because I think Vladimir Putin's a great guy, because I don't, he's a thug. But, you know, and, and 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 people at that level are just generally thugs. All right. And I mean, any resident of the United States is a thug. If you're in that office, you're capable of despicable behavior. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in that office. So it's not because I, you know, I'm sort of hypnotized with this ridiculous anti-Russian sentiment, which pervades much of the, the discourse. OK, but at the end of the day, there's still people. And just in virtue of being people, I hold that there is in some level a certain modicum of decency, which is almost indestructible and which will stay the hand of someone who isn't going to use those weapons. Of course, I face the two grievous counterexamples of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where I can only extend the benefit of the doubt that before then no one had ever actually seen what these things would do. And so they have kind of like the protection of a certain epistemological innocence. Uh, not that that really goes that far for, you know, for, for mitigating the, the, the profound evil of those actions. But well, that, that's where Anders is different. So the one, I don't want to be unfair. No, no, no. One please. of the things that Anders emphasizes is the very fact that we had developed those bombs was not a matter of testing it because of epistemological innocence. It was the fact that we had them, which meant that we had to use them. So Anders' emphasis is that if you've got it, you're going to use it. And he his argument repeated again and again is that the having of weapons means that you will deploy those weapons. And his argument is that we have repeatedly used atomic bombs. In fact, maybe the atomic bombs are not as devastating or as dangerous or as have the consequences people claim that they have, that's entirely possible because this is a device which by its drastic nature, you believe you cannot use, which is convenient because that way you never have to put it to the test. So it's a very, very important kind of back and forth arrangement on that. But Anders point himself again and again is that if we have it, we'll use it. And that having Every, it, the, the potential must be actualized. Right. That's that's probably the one takeaway from Anders that it would be unfair of me not to underline. He thinks that if you've got that, that you don't that deterrence is nonsense, that you don't have it to deter, that you're going to use it. But I certainly agree with the logic of deterrence is nonsense because if you're going to use it, you're not going to be deterred from using it because it. Because to, to use a nuclear weapon, you're so psychopathic to like use it that you're not going to you're, then you're going to be uh, inoculated from an, uh, from from a, a rationality of uh, self interest. Okay, <laughs> I mean it's an act of such cosmic evil that you're actually, as far as I'm concerned, renouncing the the, the narratives of geopolitic in which the, the action is so. So when Harry S. Truman you know, decided to drop those bombs, yeah. he wasn't actually dropping those bombs because of the structure of the war or what have you. 
he was actually exhibiting a kind of uh, God defying pride by, by, you know, killing hundreds of thousands of millions of people in a blinding instant. Right. It's, it, it's, it puts you outside of all human conversation. Right. That, that, that's, I'm just denouncing my own perspective. All right. So, but, um, Yes, but, but. Uh, he, he's he, Anders is very interesting on this. He lived through it, and he's one of the few people who wrote about it. If he had written largely on Auschwitz and Birkenau, he would have been very successful. What made him the reason the reason Don Eide could could make sure he'd never be translated is that he made the mistake of writing about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the U.S. GIs. That's who he wrote about. And he certainly could have written about the other, and he did, but he didn't write enough about it. What he wrote about was us, and we don't like that. So I think that ID didn't have a challenge to turn him down, to turn down the publication, because he seemed to be anti-American. And a German who was anti-American is a very bad thing indeed. So that's very interesting. So we should probably round it up here, because we're okay. pretty much up at an hour. But I don't feel like at any point I gave you the opportunity to really I mean, you've mentioned themes that you discuss in your book, but if you wanted to talk about what is the overall, you know, thesis of the book or what have you, or do you want to say anything about the book or anything else at all before it's you wrap it up? It's philosophy of technology. It's Anders as a philosopher of technology, of, of technology and particularly with respect to radio and other things. Anders is very comprehensive. He sees it all related. What we're doing on Zoom, the bomb, all of it for him is fairly connected, as well as our own obsolescence. Mm -hmm. So there are whole reflections on the human and the idea of a, of a, of, of a perfecting the human, making the human better, the, the so-called trans, you know, right. focus. So there's, there's no quick, quick summary of what's in the book, 50 cents in a box top. Right. No, no. There are a bunch of chapters. And one of the sad things is you really can't after people have refused to translate. And it's still not in English. Right? So there's something silly about writing a book on it because it, it, people can only read little bits and pieces. So it's like the like the elephant, you know, and w which part of the elephant have you touched? And then you'll have a sense of it. Well, hopefully a translation in in English will eventually be forthcoming. The efforts to sculpture not with not I hope so, but you need you really need both of them. And I think we needed to have been in contact with his, with his thought in his lifetime. So I think probably when you asked that first question, what was my motivation? I kind of felt bad for him. So I thought someone should write about him, and so part of it, part of it that that that, that this is valuable, especially you you connected with with Illich and and Alul, and I bring in these names as well because mm -hmm. those are all the kind of peripheral names in philosophy of technology, as opposed to the more triumphalist philosophy of technology, which is we can make it better and technology will save us, and you just have to work with it, and it'll all be great in the end. Well, you know. On an optimistic note, yes. right, I'm reminded there of Ogambin's remark about, uh, about Illich, you know, his legibility, that this is the moment of his legibility, yes. right? Yes. So, yes. Right? So yes. perhaps this is also a moment of Anders' legibility. Yes, you could definitely see what he was saying in 1964, 1972, but maybe we needed these decades to mature as an audience and see the situation to now say, oh, now I see what he was saying, right? You know, so maybe that that can give us some hope that his thought will yet be recalled. I agree, but what about Agamben? I mean, to me, Agamben had been the most important philosopher in 2020, February of 2020, he was just top of the world. By the time he started speaking out, he was just bottom of the bottom. And that's the, so maybe it's the leg, it's the moment of legibility, but it's also the moment of eclipse because we still don't believe everything Illich says about medicine in Medical Nemesis, which is also at the beginning of Tools for Conviviality, is true. 
Every so often, doctors write another essay saying, "Yup, it's worse." That's all they say. Right. They, no. they never, they never say, "Oh, we're not killing people anymore." No, they still are. So just by accident, it's like lost another one. They, they, they don't mean to, which is, I think, the most important thing. Doctors don't mean to do these are mistakes, but in many cases, or their thoughtlessness is in the case of the current regime, but, but. Or, or assumptions that this is you should just do it because you just should because you just should, which is insane. Because in point of fact, there's no way to know what side effects are from any vaccine except for years that haven't happened yet. That hasn't changed. That science has never changed. So Illich's moment, but a moment in the midst of the most incredible blinding with respect to medicine that I think I've ever seen. It's nope. uh, it's 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 truly remarkable. And uh, I mean, I, I sense that it will precipitate a great cultural divide. Uh, oh. But what because, do you mean? Well, I mean, because I because I said these things. Well, uh, I say you know that I have virtually lost all faith in contemporary medicine as just a project that is utterly bankrupt. Not because the people who are situated within it are ill-intended, but because they are in the thrall of ideological presuppositions which interfere with real healing. Yes, yes. And so the iatrogenesis of the medical complex isn't just the clinical iatrogenesis that comes about uh, for mistakes or misunderstandings. It's the deeper cultural iatrogenesis, the medicalization of the human body, the, the, you know, the, 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 the alienation of our own health from our own subject. These are the deeper, more problematic harms that cascade forth out of you know, the medical system that makes it really a nemesis to actual health and the actual you know, good medicine. Uh, but but, but also our theme because I agree sorry, with that completely. Um, but I've also encountered is that there are presuppositions to the models that they, of, upon which they're operating, which need to be questioned, even on very basic grounds. The whole, you know, this is this is not a very YouTube friendly conversation now. Okay, but. Um, well, I often think of the flogist. Just song, Ivan right? Illich. The the the, the, the <laughs> legend, the the, uh, the legacy of the flogiston. That's what I tell people. I ask people, you know, what the what are you familiar with the flogiston? Most people haven't heard of the flogiston, right? In the mid nineteenth century, the flogiston was considered a reasonable idea as to why combustion happens. And they figured out why combustion happens. They realized that the concept of the flogiston should be abandoned. No one really worries about the phlogiston anymore. Well, there's a concept operating in pathology, which seems upon scrutiny to deserve a fate similar to that of the phlogiston. <laughs> to invoke that concept critically is to invite quick and violent censure, not just by uh, official means, but also just by means of becoming kind of social pariah. And so this actually circles back to like what I mean by a cultural divide. Right. There will be people who will say, we just have to let this whole way of approaching healing death and disease go. And then there are people who will want to retain it. Very hard to sort of walk the, you know, be, you know, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not saying that everything is bad, but you have to, but that actually then comes back to the whole question of a relationship with technology, right? You know, like, and the soul. You know, in for and the penny, soul. in for the pound. And the soul. So, so the subtitle of, of Anders' first book has to do with the soul in this age. So it is, it is, it is concerning the soul in the age of the second industrial revolution. So he's very concerned in his first book with the soul and what has happened to the soul and the future and the fate of the soul. So there's no way that he's, in, even though he's saying he's, he's not going to say yay or nay about, he's an agnostic about God. He's not saying he knows, but nonetheless, it's the soul that he's concerned with and it's the soul we would lose. So soul. that's not that, the soul. that, that may be it right there.
that's that's it right because we we're, we're we're no longer like mass individuals right we're not we're not just the uh, an assemblage of information right there's something to who or what we are that is enshrined within the concept of the soul but a soul is very difficult to quantify and schematize and, uh, that's right and that's what Anders was in the end at least it was important enough for him to put it in his subtitle concerning the soul well thank you so much for the conversation i do appreciate it i feel like you've been very generous with your time so and i hope i um if there's anything i can do for you please please uh please uh feel free to to ask so this is a delight these are huge questions <laughs> <laughs> they're the only questions so like, i don't know why people talk about this stuff more often so we all should. right we should very very nice to meet you and i and i love the thinking the thinking thomas i think that's a great title i think it's great thank you thank you doctor i'm, I'm almost afraid to say your name but is it uh, oh, just like just think illich babish illich it's okay very 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 it's not said that way for babish i don't know sorry you're gonna stop all right i mean I, I, I grew up in New York. thank you about that <laughs> all right anyway you have a lovely evening bye bye Bye. 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 Cheers.